Hi everyone, welcome to The Witching Week. Today is episode number 92. In today's episode, we're going to look at a recent trip to Avebury and something strange that happened there. We're going to be looking at Livington Bead House and we're going to be discussing the energy that's raised by us as a collective in the run-up to Samhain. So grab a cup of tea, put some incense on, get comfy and we'll explore the witching week. Hi everyone, welcome back. Thank you for being here, thank you for watching. I'm Wren, I'm known as the Cemetery Witch, and every Friday we get together for a cup of tea and a bit of a chinwag. We talk about the turn of the wheel and the seasons and the weather, what we've all been up to, and some witchy subjects. So yeah, if you're here for the first time, welcome. And if you are someone who's been here before, then welcome back and thank you so much for tuning in again. So I'm really sorry I wasn't here last week. I had one of those Fridays where I just needed to catch up on everything and um, I was quite breathless as well with my heart. So I wasn't feeling great. I wasn't up to talking for 40 minutes. So I caught up on a bit of witchy admin instead. So I'm sorry about that. I'm back. Um, I intend to be here now every Friday for the foreseeable, but sometimes you just have to listen to your body, don't you? So we're finally in October. I've decided that I definitely definitely like October better than September. September just feels kind of like damp and clammy. Uh, we've had some really nice afternoons in October. They've still been warm, but it just feels so much drier. Today we've woken up to our second frost. We had our first frost on the 4th of October, which is very early. And this morning we've woken up to a frost and it is absolutely beautiful out there. So yeah, I think the shock of capture, you know, and past that, the fact that we are now, we're, you know, we're in autumn and we're moving towards the sort of darkest and coldest part of the year. I'm over that now. But yeah, I've, I've definitely decided that October I enjoy way more than September and I'm just embracing it and getting on with it. And I've been staying warm by going to the library and by generally trying to sort of move around a little bit more at home. But it's really difficult when you've got work to do and, you know, you can't be moving around all day long. It's very, very easy easy to get cold here so yeah it's been okay we're doing okay and actually I looked out the window this morning and saw the frost and just thought how beautiful the sun shining we had a very exciting evening last night but I'll tell you about that in a little bit so what have you guys been up to let me know in the comments which I have caught up on I always read your comments when I get them. I just don't always have time to answer them there and then in that moment. And I like to give them the time that they deserve. So I always answer all of my comments fully. I know it's not brilliant for the algorithm not to respond straight away, but I don't really care about that. I think that when I respond, it should be done properly. So um, I then read them for the second time, take them in and then give you a reply. But sometimes it does take me a little while. So my apologies about that, but please, Please tell me what you've been up to. I'd love to hear. I'd love to hear all about your plans for sowing, which of course is coming up. And I would just love to know, you know, what you've been up to sort of magically or in a mundane sense, you know, have you been to football? Have you been following something cool on TV? Is there a programme you've been watching? It doesn't have to be witchy. It's just lovely to hear what you guys have all been up to. So I have been very, very busy myself with Spooky Season, especially over on Patreon. Thank you so much if you've joined this year and thank you so much if you've joined this month as well. I hope you're really, really enjoying it. I've been doing a little bit of crochet where possible. I am making a blanket for my best friend. She's created me some lovely blankets over the years and I thought, right, I'm, I'm gonna learn how to do this as well. I'm never gonna get to her level. My brain just can't cognitively take that level of expertise, but I'm doing a very, very simple stitch and it took me quite a while to learn that. So yeah, I'm really, really enjoying that. A brilliant winter activity or autumn activity. And the thing about making a blanket is it gets really big so it's on your lap so it keeps you warm. So I've been really, really enjoying that. Definitely making some space now for some sort of, you know, cosy, huddled up activities that don't take up much energy. I've been watching some 
spooky documentaries and some weird and wonderful things on YouTube that keep being recommended to me. There's some really, really good things out there. I was watching um, a program about a property in America that has had lots of spirit activity and you actually see they film a chair moving. It was quite something really, really fascinating. So I'm actually going to compile a list. I'll probably put that up um, over on Patreon in November because I reckon there's some more good bits to come. But I'm going to compile a list and share it over there. Uh, of all the things that I have been watching and it's on a range of subjects. I watched a really, really good programme about um, near-death experiences, which was very, very interesting and eye-opening. So yeah, I will compile a list and I will put it all together for you guys. Um, hello, if you're watching and you are a member of my Patreon. Um, I've just been going with the flow this month, really, to be honest. I mean, I have had a lot of work to do. September and October have been absolutely chock-a-block, but in, just in terms of my emotions and, you know, how my body feels and how I'm feeling about autumn and winter coming up, I'm really learning to go with the flow and not to fight it. I think that has been one of my biggest achievements this year because I do get quite quite worried about this time of year, as I've explained before on this show. What would you say? I know we're not fully through the year yet, but what would you say that your biggest achievement has been this year? Um, I think this year has actually been quite transformational, to be honest. There's a lot of things personally that I have achieved. And also personally, um, there's been a lot of very big challenges as well. So I think I've done quite well this year considering. I've got in that sort of like reflective New Year mood. I don't know if that's anything to do with Samhain. Obviously, the Celtic peoples and many of their societies considered November to be the New Year after Samhain. So yeah, maybe it's that energy coming in at the moment. I do feel like this in January again as well. And also again in the spring, but I don't think there's anything wrong with having a chance to just reset and restart again. I think that's actually quite nice. So I was having a think about this time of year and it struck me actually, the amount of people that I see online and speak to personally, just how many people get excited for Samhain and for just this month in general. Um, yeah, it's either an excitement about the autumn, excitement about Samhain and those in the Southern Hemisphere, some of them are getting excited about the summer and it getting a bit warmer, although I know it's getting sort of hot there already. Um, and I just thought about that energy that is being raised, a huge amount of energy. And I thought, what can we do with it? Now, obviously there is a lot of magical workings that happen around this time, work with our ancestors and all sorts of rites and rituals and observations and celebrations. I think of all that excitement and that anticipation raised by so many people. And I, I was just thinking, wouldn't it be lovely if we had another day in the calendar? So one that doesn't sort of coincide with any other major festivals, so not near Yule, Christmas, not near Samhain, and perhaps not near Beltane, although um, I guess the subject matter I'm going to choose in a moment, it would kind of work for Beltane, but people are focused on Beltane. But wouldn't it be great if we had a day in the year where we raise the same amount of energy and then we used it towards something else? So healing the world, for example, healing the planet, healing the people on the planet. And we had this month long build up, this significant raising of energy. I think that would be really, really good. I think that would be really good for our planet. Planet. I think it would be really good for the people and animals on the planet. So yeah, what do you think? Do you think this is this is something that we could do? Do you think people would get as excited for, you know, raising energy in this way and having a date where we then funnel that into healing or some positive work of some kind? Do you think people wouldn't quite get on board with that? Do you think just naturally you, we wouldn't be able to sort of encourage that. Is this something that I should start within the witchcraft and pagan community? Um, I've never seen anyone mention anything like this before. So if I see any of you bringing this up, then I know that you've you've pinched my idea. But no, jokes aside, um, I just think it would be really lovely, wouldn't it?
a day, a day that we all get excited about months long that has symbolism and it has meaning and it, it's it's as big to us as Beltane or Samhain and we all work together consciously or unconsciously because I doubt many people have actually thought about the huge amount of energy we're raising as a collective and we get excited to have a day where we put we give something back we put something back and I think that's what witchcraft is all about it's about balance and also you know when we when we work with magic and we raise energy we have to think about what we do with that energy but we also have to think about kind of replacing it as well you know we've used it we have to give something back so yeah i think that would be a really lovely idea this might be something that i might start uh, who knows um it maybe it could take off i don't know so talking of energy I said in the introduction that we had a bit of a strange occurrence at Avery. So on the 28th, so I've been away for two weeks, haven't I? This is, um, it's been two weeks since I've done the Witching Week, but on the 28th, on the Saturday, it was my husband's birthday and we went down to Avebury. It was a beautiful day, much like today. We had a little mooch around the shops. We had a little mooch around the stones um, and then we, we sat down to have a drink at the pub in the afternoon and something really, really strange happened. It, so he took a crystal that he felt was connected to his mum and he wore a ring that contained his dad's ashes and he brought these two objects with him to Avery and they were sort of interacting with each other. If you had them in your hand, they would kind of repel each other, which is weird because gold, it doesn't have any magnetic sort of properties as I'm aware the stone that he's got doesn't either um, but it was like that repelling you know when you put the wrong ends of magnets together and they push away that that invisible force that pushes away they were doing that and then he was holding the stone in his hand well and the ring he did it with both objects and his hand was practically at a right angle and both objects were sticking to his hand and not dropping off. Really, really weird. I did take some photos. I'll share a photo. And the weird thing about the stone is we bought that as obsidian and it was black when we first got it. And now it's got these bright green flecks in it. When you hold it in the light and you, you don't have to have much light it's got these bright green flecks in it. So if you've got any idea what kind of stone that is, it was sold to us as obsidian, perhaps it still is. Um, and yeah, very, very weird, very, very interesting. Now I've realized I've done it again. I've started the video without doing our tea and incense. So let me show you now what I am drinking and burning. So we've got focus and then we have got um, Karma by Satya. Now, I didn't get much sleep last night and I'm going to tell you why in a minute. My excitement got the better of me last night. But yeah, so that is what I'm, I'm I was going to say smoking, what I'm burning and what I'm drinking. So yeah, um, really interesting day out in Avebury, very energetic. Now, Justin was born just a few miles down the road in Rawton and being his birthday and then having those um, objects tied to his mum and dad he wondered if there was some sort of energetic exchange taking place there it will be interesting to see if we went on another day whether that would happen again or whether you know that wouldn't be a thing um may have you ever had this experience at Avebury sort of like magnetic through your body sort of sensation with things sticking to you I would really really love to hear I would really love to hear so after Avebury, um, we got back fairly early. I spent most of the evening asleep because I was worn out. And then the next day we got up and we went to Liddington Bead House with Justin's brother. Um, historic grade one building in Rutland. It was a former palace of the Bishops of Lincoln. So a huge, beautiful beautiful place in an area sort of slap bang in the middle of the area that the bishops of Lincoln would travel around um, and after the reformation the house passed to the Cecil family and it became a private house and then sometime around 1600 the Cecil family actually turned it into um, a bead house an arms house so it was charitable housing for the poor in the middle ages and it held 12 beadsmen 
and that had to include two women, widows over the age of 45, and everyone had to be free of lunacy, leprosy, or the pox, the French pox, as they called it. So it was a beautiful day out. There is a very, very strong but peaceful energy in that building. Um, you, you can see from the outside it's a reasonably big building, but you just don't get a sense of it until you go inside. So we went in the great chamber, the bishop's great chamber, which is where the bishop would perhaps sit and do his work and he would um, receive guests. Henry VIII actually visited there twice, um, 30 years apart, and obviously that was before the Reformation. Uh, the last people to live there were there in 1939 and when you go in it's just very very basic walls. A couple of the rooms have got small fireplaces in, so atmospheric and then you can go up in the loft as well which was just a huge and beautiful space. I absolutely adore old houses like this, it's over 600 years old. And to just be there knowing that people have lived there for hundreds and hundreds of years was just really, really special. The rooms are just beautiful. I really, really recommend if, you, if you're in the Northamptonshire, Rutland, Lincolnshire, Leicestershire, any of those counties, you are never going to be too far from Liddington. I really recommend you check it out. It's absolutely beautiful. And I think this time around Samhain, um, even though it's really cold in these places, they did have some radiators in the rooms, but they weren't turned on yet. So we were all bundled up in our coats and stuff. So it was freezing. But I think this time around Samhain or in the lead up to Samhain is a really, really lovely time to go and meet and um, to go and visit these places uh, where our ancestors lived and worked and their lives played out. There's me saying meet, because I'm imagining, you know, meeting up with these people from hundreds of years past. And there were people just like you and me that were just, you know, putting one foot in front of the other, taking each day, you know, each week, day by day, and just trying to survive. And it's so interesting reading about their lives, what their lives entailed in the bead house. Um, there were some beautiful stories. There were some of these little, um, little posts that you press the button and then they explain some history and tell you some history about who lived there, the kind of lives they led, what it was like for them. And um, yeah, just so interesting to compare to our lives today. So really, really wonderful, highly recommend. We had our wedding anniversary yesterday, so it's been quite a busy couple of weeks. We have Justin's birthday and then we have our wedding anniversary. And that was lovely. Uh, we both worked in the day. And then last night we went out with friends from our moot. We had a lovely meal. And then we were just getting into bed and I was looking at my phone. I was just checking on Patreon, just popping in to say hello and see how everyone's doing and to share sort of my evening. And I, I saw that someone had shared some pictures of the Aurora. They It was only like an hour previously. And they'd been out in the garden and I, they'd seen the aurora for the first time ever in their whole life. And I thought, oh, I must have missed something because I have an app, as you guys know. Excuse me. And I checked the app and indeed we were on red, full red alerts. I looked out the window and I thought, I'm sure I can see a faint red glow. I'm sure I can see it in the sky. So I said, my other half has said to Justin, right, that's it. I'm I'm, I'm getting up. I'm going to have a quick look because we've got clear skies this evening. So last night was just clear and crisp and dry. The stars were out. It was much like the day that we met 11 years ago yesterday. So I thought, how amazing. If the aurora is out and there's any chance I can see it at all, it will be really, really special on our wedding anniversary. So I said to Justin, the aurora is up. I'm sure of it. I'm sure I can see. And he's like, no, it isn't. No, it's not. Don't be silly. So anyway, I came outside and sure enough, I could see the red with my naked eye. Just it, it's, it's one of those things being down in the town because usually you have to go up high somewhere, dark, and apparently you could see it dancing and moving a little bit and it was a lot clearer. I was down here on the edge of town, so there is a bit of light pollution, but I could see it enough with the naked eye. But it's at the point at which if you didn't know to look out for it, you could maybe miss it. And, you know, unless you 
take a moment to gaze up at the sky and then go, oh, it looks a little bit red over there. So we caught it, we caught it. And it was just, we realized as we panned around, it was just all there above us, absolutely amazing. So on our anniversary, on the 10th of October, we had the Aurora lighting up the sky. So I shouted, I opened the front door, shouted up, well, I didn't really have to shout, he can hear me up in the bedroom, but I said to Justin, there is a huge red, red patch in the sky, the Aurora is out. So he appeared in his little bear onesie and came outside and we got some shots. We didn't stay out long, it was very, very cold. Um, he's in his onesie, I'm in my dressing gown with nothing else on underneath. So we came in pretty quickly because it was it was about three degrees at this stage and it looks like people had an amazing time. Um, I know up sort of Newark Quay, um, out in the dark, people could see it moving and dancing. So I, by the time I got into bed last night at about 11 o'clock, which is really late for me, especially on a school night, um, I was absolutely wired and fizzy just knowing that the aurora was there in the sky. And when I woke up this morning and looked at the app, it, it's just been red all the way through. We've had a really, really large um, solar storm by the looks of it. We are at, we've spoken about the aurora so much this year because we've had a great year. 2024 has been brilliant for spotting the aurora. We're at the peak of an 11 year solar cycle. Um, we've had huge solar activity, including the biggest solar storm since um, 2003. So they reckon this is probably going to continue a little bit, perhaps into 2025. And then slowly this is just going to fizzle out. And then I'm guessing it will be another 11 years before, you know, perhaps we get to see this again. And we're talking not just the sort of north of the UK being able to see it. Usually it would just be Scotland, maybe some of the north of England, maybe like North Humbria. But we are seeing it like nationwide at the moment, which is absolutely amazing. I've waited all my life. I've waited 43 years. Um, I mean, that always sounds a bit funny, doesn't it? Because I wasn't looking out for it when I was five, but I'm 43 years old and I have never seen the Aurora in my life until this year. And now that's the second time I've seen it. And last night was incredible. It was just as incredible as back in May. And that was the 10th of May, I do believe. So we've had the 10th of May and the 10th of October. There's something very special about the number 10, clearly. And I know that it's, I know it's been visible elsewhere on other evenings, but this was another one of those huge evenings where everybody across the UK has um, had a chance at seeing it and really, really big displays, big enough and strong enough that we've been able to see it down here in the town. So yeah, very, very interesting. I am rural, there isn't a huge amount of light pollution, but there's. it still would have been better to go up to somewhere dark, but the fact that we can stand outside our house with street lamps going and stuff like that and you can see the aurora was quite something. So we're nearly halfway through the month already. I'm thinking of sowing now. What are you doing? Are you prepared for it? Have you got anything special planned? Are you going to a sowing event maybe? We are definitely looking at having a dumb supper. I want to do it properly before. We have had sort of semi dumb suppers where we've you know had the intention that we're having a meal and we're contemplating our loved ones and our ancestors that have passed over. But this time I want to do it properly, black tablecloth, um, black clothes, not saying a single word, walking in quietly, um, to having the meal and then walking out to end the ritual and having pictures on the table and stuff. I've got a little bit of organisation to do to make that work, but that's what I'll be doing on Samhain. I'm always in by nightfall and I always have my candles burning and I have a candle burning through the night, so I will not get much sleep on that night. That's a Thursday, so that was three weeks yesterday. So we haven't got long now. So of course we have the folklore of the wild hunt in relation to Samhain. So this is a motif occurring across various societies um, and cultures all across the world, really. And this hunt is, it's a wild chase. 
is a wild chase during what seemed to be like a wet or stormy or crazy night. And it is led by a figure, typically male. So Odin, for example, in Norse mythology, Odin leads the wild hunt. But there are some female characters. Um, I think in, um, what is it? Let me think. <sighs> Slovakian. Possibly. Don't quote me on that. That's that's a female in some stories. Um, but anyway, there's a group of supernatural hunters in pursuit. So this could be elves, fairies, valkyries, any kind of sort of creature. There's lots of variations of this story. And basically, they rampage through the night of Samhain. It is the wild hunt. They collect the souls of the newly departed. In England, it was known as Hurler's Assembly or Woden's Hunt. So I was just doing a little bit of reading about this this week. Really, really interesting. Again, the Witching Week is not supposed to be like an expert view on everything. I don't give you tons of information about each topic. The idea is if it's something that interests you, then you can go away and research it yourself. So because, I mean, I'm not I'm not an expert at all on most things. Um, I know a little bit about a lot of things. But yeah, this is just to get your interest going. And maybe I might bring up something that you've never heard of before. Not in the case of the wild hunt most people know about this um, in Scandinavia it was known as the Asgard ride and in Welsh folklore Gwyn Abnud was the wild huntsman on a demon horse so he collected souls at night and he was accompanied by his dogs of hell so he was god of the underworld so he was responsible for going out on that night and collecting up the souls. So I imagine, you know, in with this folklore, there would be, you know, the sort of the story that you stay in, you stay in, you stay out of the way in case you get swept up by the wild hunt. So I thought just as a final topic, um, before we do some cards, I thought we could talk a little bit about tarot decks. So I've got this really lovely deck called the Morgan Greer deck. And I picked this up some time ago in Avery, I think it was back in the sort of the summer months and it's really really beautiful it's got these lovely illustrations that i think are quite groovy like some of them i think are a bit they're a bit sort of art deco slash 1970s they've got lovely lovely colors and um, i would really like to work with them i haven't actually got around to using them yet but the thing that's putting me off is the thin cardstock they're they're not good quality at all and I wondered, what decks do you guys use? Not in relation to cardstock, but what decks do you reach for when you're doing a reading? Is there a particular deck that you love using that is really, really good quality? Are there any decks that you love that aren't good quality? Now, you guys always see me using my Rider Waite Smith deck. I've had this very deck since I was 15 and the cards are so thick and such good quality they haven't got any markings on them whatsoever so I, I and I do tend to use those if I'm reading however I do have other decks that I love for example the Druid Craft Tarot but um, they are they're really marked um, some of the cards are just super scuffed and I just can't help but feel that if you were to read with these and you know, you're picking cards yourself or you're getting someone else to pick them, that you know, sometimes you can be drawn to these little marks or sometimes you can learn what the cards are and then it has a bit of a bias on your reading and on your, you know, your selection of cards. So that is not brilliant. But yeah, I just wanted to know what cards do you tend to use for reading? And I wondered if you had decks that you use for different times of the year. I'm kind of really, really drawn to using these now that we're heading into the sort of autumn winter season. They kind of feel right for that. It's, it's strange. But yeah, let me know in the comments if there is a deck that you recommend for its quality which decks you love to read, which decks really, really speak to you. Maybe if there's a deck that you bought that you thought you'd get on with that you didn't. I absolutely, I just think tarot is fascinating and there are so many decks out there now. There are literally, there's probably thousands. I would, I would, I would guess that there are thousands. Just a quick trip around Instagram that just brings up so many different decks, you know, you see people using them. It's absolutely bonkers. So yeah, let me know. Let me know about your tarot preferences and we will pick some cards for today's reading. 
Okay, so we've got an interesting selection of cards here. I picked four today. Four seems to be um, the number that is most often, you know, feels right. So we have got the, um, we've got the Six of Swords. We have got the Queen of Pentacles. We have got the Ten of Swords and we have got the Ace of Pentacles. So interesting numbers there and um, yeah, interesting Swords and Pentacles. So this looks like some of you are moving away from a really, really difficult situation. You might not have had any choice in this. It might have been something that has been forced upon you and it might feel very, very scary at the moment. You might feel like you're completely out of your depth. However, this is a moving away from a particular situation for your higher good. You are basically traveling towards better days, calmer waters, um, a much better situation. But what can be really, really difficult about this is if you've had that, you know, that hasn't been as a result of choice. You know, this is something that has happened. This is something that is forcing you to either make that decision or has just forced you without that decision to do this and at the moment it just it feels scary it feels big you feel overwhelmed you feel completely out of your depth but there is light on the horizon and um, you have been feeling pretty awful um, you have reached a point where things really can't get any worse than they are. The good news about that is there is only one way that you can go from that when you've reached your absolute lowest of your lows you, you you know you can't feel any worse you're in pain things can only get better after that so this is very much a feeling that is connected to that situation you know being forced to move in a different direction basically and it feels painful it feels hard it feels like a huge mountain to climb and there yeah you it, things couldn't get any worse really but you are moving out of this situation and the only way that you're going to cope with this right now is to be extremely loving and nurturing towards yourself self-care all the way taking care of yourself all the way yes taking care of those around you if there are people involved like children perhaps but self-care you know putting your oxygen mask on yourself first so that you can put the oxygen mask on the other people around you you can help them you help them by helping yourself so this time calls for some very very gentle nurturing some baby steps some basically mothering of yourself um you know perhaps mothering those around you but most importantly mothering yourself taking care of yourself it's not selfish at all if you're going through something and you're going through something difficult then it's really really important to do this and then you're going to find that the clouds are going to clear you're going to move into calmer waters things are going to start to settle down and because you will be in the right place i always feel like when things are moving in the right direction things flow much more easily and then that's when the opportunities start showing up the opportunities arise and um, the the opportunity to build something beautiful to build something better is going to come so it sounds like there could be some emotional turbulent stuff going on for some of you coming up if it does then those are the points to consider you know that this change is for you know your higher good your better good for a better life so if you are going through that hang in there it will all come good it will all come good in the end those opportunities those fresh starts are going to be yours you just have to navigate this really really difficult point at the moment so that's it for today that's it for the witching week so i'm wishing you a lovely week i hope you got to see the aurora last night and i will be back next friday with episode 93 i'm sending you so much love wishing you all a fantastic week love and blessings bye